Now the themes for appropriateness going forward are going to be clinical judgment, acute coronary syndromes, and for stable angina, what the government is interested in, and, and this is based largely on guidelines that have been developed by the profession, is making certain that people that undergo intervention for stable angina have appropriate non-invasive studies that show that the blood supply to the heart muscle is compromised and, or that they have progressive symptoms or an increasing burden of disease. Appropriate versus non-appropriate. And if we look at, this is the geographic variation of the rates of stress testing prior to elective percutaneous coronary intervention. Okay, so does the doctor do a stress test prior to doing a PCI? And what we can see is that these vary enormously around the country. So some places they do a lot of stress tests, sometimes some places they don't very much stress testing. This is the kind of thing that, now, the next question is what's right? What is correct? Well, nobody really knows that. There, there, there are guidelines that are um, published, very largely based on a combination of expert opinion and some studies that are done that tends to define the process that people uh, ought to go through. Uh, but like everything else, in, in some uh, selected circumstances, that may not be right. I can tell you, we are looking at our own center. Uh, we're both in terms of imaging and in terms of, of um, uh, PCI, in terms of how many uh, do we think by the current criteria are uh, indicated, how many are clearly not indicated, and how many is it just too difficult to tell from the standpoint of documentation. So the results from the Medicare studies is that only 44% of Medicare beneficiaries underwent stress testing within 90 days of elective PCI. Now, I think that most non-invasive cardiologists would say, gee, that seems awfully low to me. We, 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 would, we would think that, that that ought to be greater. And there is enormous variability in, in those numbers, uh, depending upon uh, the area that they're seen. And so having a decreased likelihood of having a stress test are these uh, issues right here. Female gender, age greater than 85, a history of congestive heart failure, prior cath, but also treatment by a physician doing a lot of PCIs. So if th there is a documented tendency, if someone does a lot of PCIs, that they don't do as much stress testing before they do the PCI. So, these issues, you're going to see more and more and more and more come up because the government is not just concerned about risk, they are concerned about cost as, well, they might be concerned about cost. Now the other thing, another thrust of this is what's called shared decision making. And in Canada, they did a study where they showed a video without the doctor being there, okay, to patients that were about to go, undergo revascularization, and they found a control group, 75% of them chose to have revascularization. In the, in the uh, uh, study group, only 58% of them chose to undergo revascularization. I mean, if you did that for everybody, that's billions of dollars that, that are spent on those procedures, rightly or wrongly. Now, payment reform, whatever that's going to be, is also going to impact greatly on all the hospitals that are involved in this type of, of uh, arena. And basically what it comes down to, the best way that I could explain it, of uh, payment reform, is today hospitals under, assume short-term financial risk for a hospital admission. So a number of, in, in, this is not true with all healthcare plans, but diagnostic related groups where the hospital receives a certain level of payment for a certain level of problem, uh, puts the hospital at risk for that episode. Because if the hospital's costs exceed that payment, then the hospital loses money. Okay. 
the payers, including the government, or especially the government, want hospitals. Now, one thing you're going to hear about is accountable care organizations. So what is an accountable care organization? Well, an accountable care organization is going to involve hospitals and perhaps other groups that assume some long-term financial risk for the patient. So what the payers want is not to, to be short-term risk, but to be long-term risk. How long-term? Nobody knows. Six months, a year, 18 months, two years, whatever it is. So what insurance companies would like to do is to give you a certain amount of money for taking care of a patient with a certain problem for a certain period of time. Now, I always thought that when people had insurance companies that that's what they did was they assessed risk, they quantified risk. I mean, that's why you have actuaries. Um, I think they're tired of that. Um, I, I, I think, and, and so people that are in the business of running hospitals are going to have to get good at quantifying risk. An accountable care organization, what it, well nobody knows that either, but for sure the government is, is starting out with hospitals. So a bunch of doctors in an outpatient facility is not going to be able to be an accountable care organization. So if you really look at what's happening here, is that the, is that the health care bill is trying to drive doctors and hospitals into bigger and bigger groups so that they're not dealing with a fragmented provider network. So these, th yeah, that, I mean, th th this shows an example of what that might be. So a 58-year female with moderate aortic stenosis, somebody that doesn't necessarily need an operation at, the, at this point in time. So the, the hospital is going to need to figure out how they're cared for over a period of time. How many echocardiograms are they going to have? How many times are they going to be followed up by a doctor? All these kinds of costs. And these are going to be related to both procedural things and non-procedural things. If you look at the schedule of health care reform, you know, this year these are the things that are supposed to be involved in it. Pretty innocuous from, from, from everybody's standpoint. Start some comparative effectiveness trials. One of the problems is is that the number of things where we have good data on comparative effectiveness is relatively small. Uh, coronary artery disease is one of them. But if we take a look at these new provider models, this, this is supposed to roll out in the next uh, uh, year or so. And then um, you get into 212 value-based base purchasing, whatever that is, uh, independent payment of viruses. So all of these things, and then finally in 218, this is one that I hadn't picked up until somebody showed for that, a 40% tax on high-end health plans. Uh, Christ, they don't even do that in England. Uh, and uh, so, so the world is changing. Um, and don't think it's not going to. I mean, this, you know, depending upon what radio station you listen to, there's some idea that, well, you know, this is never going to make it. They're going to repeal the ACA, and, you know, that's the way it's going to go. You know, not so, not so fast. I mean, in fact, a substantial minority of the American public thinks that it's just fine the way it is. And those that don't agree with it, a relatively few think it ought to be wiped out. So. The moral of the story is, unless something changes very dramatically politically, we are going to have a, a different health care act that is going to include many of these things that we are talking about. Um, and, and the problem is, is that hospitals will ultimately bear financial and quality responsibility. These cost savings aren't going to be automatic. Just having this health care bill is not automatically going to save costs. Uh, it, it's going to, you know, there's, the services are going to have to be decreased. I mean, that, that's the only way to even keep cost conscious. Appropriateness review is going to be a very big deal. I think it's going to be less of a big deal for cardiac surgery, 
than it is for, for cardiovascular medicine, both in imaging and in uh, intervention. But that's going to increase, and that's going to be focused very much on the hospital. In, in the appropriateness that has taken care of, or, or that has been uh, carried out so far, yes, people that have been doing unnecessary procedures, the individuals have gone to jail, but hospitals have taken a huge hit uh, from that as well. So hospitals are ultimately going to be held responsible. The magnitude of the benefit, not the p-value, not whether one treatment is better than another, but how much better. Is it 1% better or is it 30% better? And over what period of time is going to be extremely important. And there's certainly for an accountable care organization, these anatomic treatments, which up until now have been a revenue center for organizations may become a cost center. So what I've tried to do is to help you understand where we've been, how we got to where we are now, and some of the things that we think are going to impact upon treatment in the future. Now that this is going to affect both an organization like the Cleveland Clinic and an organization like Chester County. Uh, who knows, at some point in time it may be the same organization. Um, and um, those uh, uh, issues, I think, are going to have at least as the dramatic effect on the anatomic treatment of coronary artery disease in the future as changing technology. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs>